What was the first re mixed gas rebreather available for sport divers? And when was that? Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest edition of our in-depth preview for the in-depth newsletter re released right here on our YouTube channel. My name is Nico Luro. You can find me right here on the channel as well as on GUE TV with my new photography series. And I'm joined today by the rock star over to my left, Mr. Michael Menduno. <laughs> hey, Nico. How you doing? <laughs> I'm good, mate. Yep. Yourself? Very good. Doing very good today. Staying safe? Got, Got any bad holidays planned? Uh, dive trip plan. Yeah, I'm going to Mexico in uh, a week, doing uh, a week of Cozumel deep reef diving, helium diving nice. on in Cozumel. So that's nice. going to be kind of, it's a GUE trip. It's going to be kind of fun. Oh, sweet. Very cool. Yeah. Well, guys, you have not come here to discuss Michael and I's holiday plans, although I'm sure they're awesome. Um, <laughs> but you are here to see what's coming up on this month of In-Depth. Michael, what do you got for me? I got two questions for you, Nico. So first question, what was the first re mixed gas rebreather available for sport divers? And when was that? When? I couldn't tell you. My guess would be the inspiration. Ah, good guess. They, they were the first production unit in the 90s, but that's not the right answer for you. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Draeger. You've brought this up before. Dra Drager was, again, in one of the early units. It was a semi closed unit, not a mixed gas unit, but that's not the right answer. Either. Yeah, so. No, <laughs> haven't got you. All right. Well, we're going to have to come to that. Second question, a little more geeky. Uh, all the re mixed gas rebreathers, not, not the, all the electronic mixed gas rebreathers on the market, except for one, have three oxygen sensors and a software system called Voting Logic. And my question is, where did that come from? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, good. Then stick around till the end of the video. And you know, I'm not going to answer those questions for you. Yeah. Over my head this week. Stay to the end of the video, and he will he will reveal all. <laughs> this will keep Nico there for the whole time. Yeah, he'll have to yeah, have to hang around to find out. <laughs> literally. Uh, so, other so than your, this, your stories, what have you got? Well, so this is an exploration issue. You know, tech, technical divers, yep, think of exploration often in terms of a new cave system or some virgin cave passage that they'll get to lay some line in or finding a new shipwreck, you know, exploring a shipwreck. Um, but this week we're going to focus, this month we're going to focus on a different kind of exploration. We're taking a deep dive into the world of National Geographic photojournalist Brian uh, Scarry, uh, who has spent three years exploring whale culture around the globe. Uh, Brian is an old friend of mine from the 90s. He was a field editor for my old magazine, AquaCore. Um, back then, his dream was to be, he was do, just doing photography on the side. He was a shipwreck diver, and his dream was to become a National Geographic photographer. And uh, man, he's done it in spades. He's a, 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 the Rolex National Geographic Explorer of the Year a couple of years ago. He's a photographic fellow with Geographic. He won the National Geographic Photographer's Photographic Award for who inspired the other photographers most. So, and his piece, um, it's out in a new book, uh, Secrets of Whales, that just came out a few months ago over the summer. Uh, and he's got a Disney four-part uh, documentary uh, on the same subject of whales. And uh, which is bad, I should say, has uh, three, gotten three Emmy nominations so far. James Cameron is the executive producer, and they have Sigourney Weaver, uh, Weaver is the voice. Um, and really what he's focused on is um, the fact that, like humans, whales actually have culture. If you visit pods of sperm whales, for example, around the globe, they all have their ethnic food habits, you know, <laughs> they eat different things, they parent different, they have different behaviors, and these behaviors are passed down to their, their children, i.e. it's culture like humans. And so Brian in this, in this series uh, looks at sperm whales, right whales, orcas, humpbacks, 
belugas and dolphins. Um, so it's it's really fascinating. Obviously, some great photographs. And yeah. what we've done, it's an interview with him. We've really kind of dived into what is it like? You know, we, we all know kind of what cave expedition or maybe a shipwreck expedition is like, but what's it like to be on a photo expedition? Um, he was in 24 locations over the last uh, three years pr prior to the pandemic um, where the film was produced. Uh, and it talks about kind of the adventure of that and finding whales and, you know, et cetera. So uh, it's really an interesting piece. Um, and then as a companion piece, we have a story called Can We Talk to Whales? And it's about a project called Project SETI, C-E-T-I, named after the famous uh, exploration look, looking for aliens, the SETI project with the big radio telescopes. And it's uh, by a guy, Dr. David Gruber, uh, who's a professor and also a Nat Geo explorer. And uh, he's brought together a whole team of people with uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, cryptography, to decipher uh, whale language so we can be able to talk to sperm whales, which are the biggest brained creature on the planet. So um, it, it, it's really fascinating. So I, I think people will uh, will get off on it for sure. Learn something. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to live vicariously through Brian when I read this book and watch his series, because as you know, that's my old history. That's what I used to do. That's right. With Nat Geo. Oh, yes. Memories, memories, memories. It, it, you know, it always <laughs> makes me happy hearing stories like this and hearing some one of the, my former peers doing so well. It's lovely. Mm. The fact that he's got himself a Disney Plus deal, well done. Yeah. I mean, he's arguably one of our most prolific uh, ambassadors for Planet Ocean. And he's got, at the same time right now, he's got a, a shark exhibit from his shark. Uh, he had a, a book he also did called Shark. And he's got an exhibit up. Ah, yeah. A uh, Nat Geo exhibit up in Madrid, Spain right now on sharks. And he's just done a, a lot of amazing things to get the word out. He's reached tens of millions of people. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's an icon. Yeah, we need people like Brian. Yeah. He's an sure. absolute icon. He was one of my reasons for getting, you know, him and David Dubelay were my reasons for getting into yeah. what I do. So, like, yeah, he's yeah. an absolute icon. Recognize. Recognize people. <laughs> this is cool. You need to read, and it's a series you need to watch. By the way, yeah. when is the series out? The, the 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 on Disney Plus. Yes, it's out now. Uh, in fact, we have a, tra a link to a link to it in the story, but you can find it now if you just Google Disney Plus Secrets of Wales. It'll it'll come up. Perfect, Secrets yeah. of Wales. Yeah, guys, check it out. So from there, from the whales, we go to China. Uh, Duan, China, for some cave diving. Um, oh. Really interesting. The whole south of China is a big karst area. And in fact, UNESCO uh, made it a World Heritage Site in 2007. Uh, oh. This is a story by Janny um, Niskanen. He's uh, uh, from Finland. And he wrote this story. He was cave diving. We, we got some help from our friend Edmund Yu, uh, mm -hmm. who we did a story about on China cave diving or China diving. Um, yeah, so it's a huge area, probably bigger than Mexico uh, in terms of uh, cave passageways. And so it's going to be oh, wow. probably one of the new frontiers. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know that. That's oh, yeah. really yeah. big. Yeah. Wow. It's quite, ama quite amazing. The pictures are just, oh my God, wait. Well, you'll be flashing some of the pictures as I'm talking here. So uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's really astounding. So, so that's a really good piece. Um, from there, we do something interesting. We have a, a piece from our friend uh, and instructor trainer, Guy Shockey, and it's mm -hmm. called The Flexibility of Standards. So Guy talks about <laughs> the, uh, the value, the purpose, and yes, the flexibility of standards or SOPs. Yep. These are uh, diving operational standards, not training standards. So for example, in G as you know, in GUE, we have standard gases, we have standard protocols for gas switches, for uh, emergencies, et cetera. And uh, Guy kind of discusses and argues that these really free up brain power. So you don't have to create, you know, invent uh, solutions every time a problem happens because you already have, you know, kind of an SOP. Oh, if this happens, do this. If this happens, mm -hmm. do that. So um, it's a really interesting piece. And uh, along that line, uh, we have another article, uh, an excellent human factors article by uh, our friend Gareth Locke on the role 
of our, our attribution biases and language and how this affects our judgment. And he takes the case of a student being injured in a class as a case study. And uh, so the question is, was the instructor at fault? Was anyone at fault? And he really kind of explores some of our, our biases with the idea of us moving towards a just culture, i.e. a culture where we can share our mistakes openly and we can all learn from them as opposed yeah. to shaming and blaming, et cetera. So um, yeah, it's, it, it's a really good piece. So, Lovely. and I'll give a shout out to, if people haven't heard, we have, uh, Gareth is running the Human Factors Conference uh, in late September, I think it's September 24th, 25th. Uh, Dan Europe is, uh, uh, and I'm working with them on that, doing the proceedings for it. It's a virtual conference, so it'll be coming to a screen near you, any of your screens, and uh, people should Google it and check it out. It's going to be 30 speakers, not just from diving, but from other high-risk industries. So it's it's, it's nice. really pretty cool. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So shall we get back to uh, our questions? Oh, go on. Make me feel scared. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a, an article on a unit called the Electrolung. The Electrolung was invented in the 1960s by Walter Stark and Jan Canwisher. Uh, and it was really made for sport divers and others. Uh, Walter was a marine biologist. And uh, this is a very geek. It's a set. 7,000 word piece, very geeky for you home builders, <laughs> uh, really goes through every aspect of the system, how it worked, uh, his thinking. And interestingly, you know, the, the limiting factor for mixed gas rebreathers, the limiting technology was oxygen sensing. Unless you could sense oxygen in your loop, you didn't know what you were breathing. So right. uh, mixed gas, even though there were oxygen rebreathers, simple oxygen rebreathers prior to that, it took having oxygen sensors to make a mixed gas rebreather. Back in those days, this was before galvanic sensors, which we use today, and they, uh, Walter used what's called polographic sensors. It's basically a little wet battery that they would mix up before the dive. You know, you'd be pouring <laughs> chemicals and screwing it on, and it, it puts out voltage proportional to the uh, amount of oxygen, the PO2. And uh, because they were pretty unreliable, uh, Walter came up with the idea of using three of them and then what's called voting logic. So what it is, all the sensors should be the same at a given PO2, but they'll, they'll drift slightly because they're analog. And so the, the software, uh, if, if one, say a third sensor's up here and the other two are down here, the computer will say, well, the two, the majority wins. It's a majority a voting scheme. The majority wins. Right. And uh, that that and because of uh, again the unreliability, the idea was that this would increase reliability. Um, and this is carried through to today. We know today that voting logic is not it's having three sensors and voting logic is not equivalent to having a redundant system. Uh, it's just, it's, it's less than that. And because sensors can come from the same batch or be affected by the same factors, they're not really independent. So uh, it's, it's a basically less than ideal system. And we're trying to move through that. Um, but anyway, this story gets into all the geeky details. We have a bonus from our friends at Historical Diving Society, an article called 300 feet on computerized scuba. So this was a dive that the then publisher, editor of Skin Diver Magazine, Paul Zamolas did on this unit. This was before open circuit bailout was a thing. So down at 300 feet with this homemade unit. Now these are the people that pan nitrox and wrote that the <laughs> deep divers should get back in the closet and let responsible divers, you know, kind of be the ones out there. So it's kind of ironic that we have this article from 1970. So, um, and also with it, I should say, there'll be a free download of my old magazine, Aquacore, The Rebreather Issue, which we has an article from Walter. He's an old friend of mine. We had him at our tech conferences and Asia Tech back in the 90s. So um, is, he, is he the one who called you up back in the day and said, I think you're nuts? <laughs> no, that, that, that was something else. Uh, yeah. Walter, on, a scale, on a scale of one to 10, given how far the 
thought process has moved since back in the day where Night Jocks is being poo-pooed on, and I'm sure you were one of the people using it back in the day, given the legend that you are. On a scale of one to ten, how smug are you feeling right now? No. <laughs> well, it's just I. It, it it makes me laugh more than it makes me feel smart just to see how this is all kind of come yeah. around, right? Because Skin Diver Magazine, I mean, they were the dive magazine globally, yeah. pretty much. You know, uh, can't remember when they went out of business, but it was around the early '90s. They were a, a strong. Uh, not proponent opponent of nitrox and tried to slow its uh, development in fact uh, back in the day editor uh, um, uh, mr gleason yeah so uh, anyway it's 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 ironic how it all comes yep. around but then back then techies tech divers were the wild and crazies you know kind of at the back of the bus yeah and now of course it's yeah right the yahoos <laughs> And now we are the sport diving industry and the tourist divers are kind of in the back of the bus. We love them, but they're not really driving the industry anymore. So Agreed. anyway, so it's going to be a big issue. Yeah. yeah. So Wales, National Geographic, Disney, Caves in China, which is supposed to outdo Mexico. Geeky stuff about CCRs, which I'm not even going to try and repeat because frankly, look, spoiler alert. But you know this, but to the audience, my miss is very pregnant at the moment. And we've just got a pram. Putting the pram together was an achievement for me. So <laughs> reading about the CCR stuff was like, nah, <laughs> I, I, there is an audience out there for it. And it is right here on this channel. For me, that's still it over my head. I'm sure I will learn one day. But it sounds cool. And there's a load of other yeah. cool stuff. Guys, in terms of what's going on on the channel, I just I remind you every month. Every single Monday, 4 p.m. BST, British Standard Time, we have new content that goes out. We've had Annika in New Zealand telling us what she's up to on her next-gen scholarship. That was two weeks ago. Imoka has just done, over in um, Mexico, has just done an amazing, and it really is amazing, exploration dive in uh, Yakchen Sinod. That's on the channel now, link to that above. We've got this video. Dorota says she's coming back soon. Watch this space. Watch this space. They're We've out in the Red Sea right now. Yeah. They're out in the Red Sea right now. I should be there too, but our lovely government <laughs> says that Red Sea is still, that the Egypt is still on the red list for us. So I have to stay here. But it's okay. I have you to talk to. It's fine. <laughs> Not much it's of a consolation, but... <laughs> ah, behave. Michael, where can people find In Depth if they do want to download it? And how much is it? Right, so it's uh, in depth is a free publication. You can subscribe and get our you know announcements of new stories and the like. Uh, you would go to uh, in depth dot blog or gue dot com forward slash blog. Uh, the issue will be out on September second uh, this this coming Thursday, and uh, yeah, check it out. <laughs> check it out. We shall, we shall, and guys, just if you do check out that Disney Plus show, be sure to Instagram Michael or I just to let us know what you thought. We'd love to know what you thought of uh, this really, really cool whale show. Do download the newsletter. Please like the video, share the video, hit the subscribe button. And remember, new content every single Monday coming for you. So be on the lookout for that. Community Day is back this year. That's just a few weeks away. And if you want to see more of this idiot right here with this accent right here, you can find me over on GUE TV doing the photography course, Creative Imagery for Divers, which I would more than welcome you all on. So that's it from us. That is, yeah, that's a wrap. So, Michael, I will see you next month. No, I won't. I'll see you on Community see Day. You, next month. you will indeed. Thanks.